there, this is Jesse. Thank you for joining me here on my channel, The Caffeinated Bookworm. It is Saturday, and so that means it's story time. Um, today I'm going to be reading to you from The Theater of the Stars by N.M. Kelby. It is a novel of physics and memory. Chapter 1. Love is all I have ever wanted, he told her. They were seated at the cafe across from his father's fur salon. The cafe was noisy, crowded. She leaned in to hear what he was saying. She could not, but nodded as if she did. So he opened a small velvet box, offered it. Across the street in front of the salon, his father took a photograph of the moment. The ring had been in the family a long time. Her father was a romantic. He wanted to have the photo framed and give it to them at the wedding. In the spring of 1940, with the world at war, not many in Paris owned cameras. Not many owned cameras anywhere. The furrier had purchased it on the black market. The photo would have been quite an unusual gift. But when the picture was developed, it looked just like a picture of the street. The father was too far away to capture the moment. The face of his son was unreadable. The woman's long hair cloaked her response. No matter. There was no wedding. I do not see myself as being anyone's wife, the woman said. I see, the man said. Still, his father couldn't bear to throw the photograph away. For him, just knowing his son was capable of love pleased him. He didn't understand that this moment marked the unraveling of everything. Jocks, the father, died before everything came undone. Chapter 2 Outside the hotel room, the Paris sky is luminescent as gray pearls. It is nearly sunrise. Light from the street tumbles through the tall, narrow windows across Lucienne's bed, the paper of her skin. She is a large woman, no longer that young. Her cotton nightgown is twisted as is her hair, tangled like so many copper wires. Her arms are thrown open. From a distance, she looks as if she's in a newspaper photograph. The tornado long gone, she is cast aside. The only thing that remains of what was once a house, a home, a family. Lucienne is dreaming. Deep in sweat and visions, dreaming a black hole she's discovered in the northern sky. There are several types of black holes, many of them purely mathematical. They can't be seen or measured, absorb all light. Lucienne's black hole is a cannibal attached to V328 Andromedae, a dying star in the Andromeda constellation, one of many stars of the chained woman, or so Andromeda means. The irony does not escape Lucienne. She spent the past three years watching this particular part of the northern sky, feels chained to it herself. But it was worth it, she tells herself, and nearly means it. It was, a, it was the boost her career needed. The black hole Lucienne has found is remarkable, feeds off the star in a turbulent firestorm, a warped cyclone of ultraviolet rays spinning this way and that, and she saw it first. Could reasonably prove its identity before anyone else, ruled out the possibility that it's a quasar, or something other than what she was hoping it was. And so, Lucienne had the honor of naming it V325B Andromedae. The B stands for black hole. The name is not very poetic. It's more like a road map. Tells you what part of the sky to look in. At least for now. V325B Andromedae is furious and hungry, pulling everything into its swirling path, into its darkness. And now, she finds herself dreaming of it. She doesn't know why these dreams began. What triggered them? Lucienne doesn't usually dream, or at least remember dreaming. I work too hard, she tells herself. Which is true. Lucienne is the Claire Booth Luce assistant, assistant professor of astronomy at Leeds, a small private college just outside of Boston. It's a prestigious position, but unfortunately not tenured. Renewable every three years. So Lucienne feels she always has to prove herself, and so she works too hard. She's come to believe that's why her marriage to Ethan fell apart. One day she discovered they were strangers, had always been strangers. She was just too busy to notice. At least that's what she believes. Tallies up their time together as if it were one of her equations. Ten hour days at the college, months away on sabbatical, weekends working papers or books or both. And then there are the public lectures every Friday night from 9 to 11 p.m. There's more sideshows than lectures. Multimedia events with fog machines and the heavy metal music of Metallica or The Who or Pink Floyd, depending on the topic. They're not very dignified, but they sell out early and the college needs the money. And so Lucienne does it and does it well. 
But all of it takes time and time adds up. Sometimes at night when Lucy Ann can't sleep, she runs the numbers of her and Ethan's life together as one would count sheep. 16 years of marriage, it's approximately 5,838 days. Given leap years, she always begins. 140,112 hours, more or less. Then she calculates the number of hours she spent away from him. Every time she does this, she remembers a trip she'd forgotten or a weekend conference. The total of time she has spent away is 120,400 hours, which means that in 16 years, Ethan and Lucienne have spent a total of 19,712 hours together, or 821 days, or 27 months. Two years and three months is the sum total of their, of their marriage, give or take a few hours. What's wrong between Lucienne and Ethan isn't quite as simple as work, and she knows it. But most days, it's easier to blame work, somewhat less painful. Ethan is also an astrophysicist. Competent, not brilliant, but very charming. They married while they were still students. After graduation, it was difficult to find a university to hire them both. He was offered a part-time position in Gainesville, Florida. Lucien was presented the fellowship in Boston, a city she loved. Just for three years, she promised, and so they went. That was 15 years ago. At first, Ethan tried to find a suitable position so that at the end of the three years, they would have another place to go. But it was difficult. His published work was minimal. Academic history, only passable. So after a while, he stopped trying. He began to write Lucien's grants and to manage her paperwork, learn to cook well. I've used up all my ambition in a previous life, Ethan told their friends. He'd been a child star in Israel, somewhat famous, somewhat beloved. He worked in both movies and television. In his youth, he had such a sweet face, black curls like a cherub, but then he grew up. Too fast, he'd say, but never elaborate. The fame of Ethan's youth would have allowed him some cachet in their social circles, but he would never talk about it. When pushed, he'd say, I'm the perfect faculty wife now, and that's all that really matters. And through the years, he sounded less and less bitter when he said it. It's often a problem when scientists marry. There just aren't that many jobs. Compromises have to be made. What makes it worse is that astrophysicists often marry one another. It's an occupational hazard hazard of sorts. It isn't easy to date when you spend most of your nights sitting in the dark listening to the stars. And even if you have met someone not in your field, what would you have in common? Science consumes. It's competitive, intense. After a while, it becomes all you think about. Even if you're not ambitious, even if you don't feel the need to be the first to discover this or that, you're still a public dreamer. Nothing is ever completely taken for granted. Not the sun rising, not the stars coming out at night, not the burnished glow of a harvest moon. All of it is a puzzle to be solved. The nature of the work makes you think in impossible ways. Imagine impossible things and then be driven by the need to prove them equations that sometimes are too large to even be imagined much less written down and verified. Family reunions often feel like symposiums. It's an impossible life, especially if, like Ethan, you have the sense of wonder, but not the talent. It's a, Lucy Ann tells her students that if they were born in an earlier time, they'd be populating the, the asylums. Or maybe we are, she says, and we're just too busy to notice. The joke always gets a laugh, but on some level, she means it. Still, for a long time, Lucienne felt lucky to be one of the inmates, at least at her particular asylum. It's not difficult to understand why. Leeds College is a well-respected liberal arts school, which, unlike most four-year institutions, pours a good deal of money into its astronomy program. Ivy walled and nearly postcard perfect, it was named after Julianne, Julian Leeds, a department store heir with a love of stargazing, as he called it. On a brass plaque outside of the observatory, there's a quote from the journal of Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson. This is the road to the stars. Every fixture and instrument in the building, every nail and pin, has a direct reference to the Milky Way, the fixed stars, the nebulae, and we leave the Americas and history at the door when we come in. Every time Lucienne passes this plaque, she rubs it as if a Buddha for good, for good luck. The observatory itself is science grade and features a 16-inch reflecting telescope. Baby Kit, Lucien calls it because it's built just like the one at the Kitt Peak National Observatory, and it's nearly as advanced. 
The telescope is interfaced with software that will automatically locate any object you program to find and then capture the image of it with an ultra-sensitive CCD camera that will reduce and analyze it. Serious work can be done here, and is. This past year, thanks to Ethan's grant writing skills, Lucienne received a $400,000 grant from the National Science Foundation. The money will not only fund her continuing research on the black hole, but underwrite Lucienne's sabbatical so that she can finally have the time to develop a new public lecture series based on her findings, a series devoid of Pink Floyd and fog machines. The department head is skeptical about its viability, but Lucien's confident that the series will still sell out, even without the light show. The concept of black holes is the only scientific theory that Lucien knows of with groupies and 4,389 websites and conventions. It even has its own conspiracy theories. Black holes are the seeds of science fiction, she tells her students, a ripple in the space-time continuum from which nothing can escape, not even light. Technically, a black hole is a mass of dense energy that's formed when stars dies, when stars die, or at least that's what's assumed. You can't really see a black hole because no light can escape from one, so you measure what remains, the gravitational pull, the energy around it, you measure the void if you can, if it's not too great. It's difficult though, a black hole pulls everything into it, swallows it whole, just like grief. At least that's what Lucienne's begun to think. It's an odd thought she knows it, unscientific, but she can't help thinking it. She misses Ethan, grieves the loss of him, especially those moments that are so difficult to explain, the quiet moments, the grace of them, how they'd lie together before sleep, arms touching, and she'd listen to him breathe, strong and steady. In those moments, she felt connected in a way she never expected to be, loved, and now he's gone. It was her choice, but still... She grieves it. The loss of Ethan has cast a shadow over everything she does, even her work. She's come to think that the void of a star, like the loss of a loved one, is immeasurable and dark. So it seems that it's not entirely impossible that there's some connection between stars and people, at least metaphorically. And that thought always reluctantly brings Lucienne back to the M theory, which on some level still makes her cringe. The M M in the theory stands for magic or mystery or mother of all theories or membrane or matrix. Depends on who you ask. Some believe the M is for Maldacena, pronounced Maldacena, after the Harvard-based theorist Dr. Juan Maldacena, whose work in the theory is well known. The only thing that can be agreed on is that nobody can agree on what the real name is. But everyone, even the disbelievers, know it's an ultimate theory the theory of everything. The M theory asserts that everything in the world is made up of tiny membranes or brains, which vibrate and shimmer in dimensions that you can't even imagine. They're neither matter nor energy, but both. They've been called God's tinker toys. It's a, it's a theory so esoteric, it can't be proven and may never be. There's no way to measure something that's already been defined as measurable. Before Lucienne discovered the black hole, she always believed that the M stood for mentally impaired. She once attended a convention and watched in horror as 200 scientists danced to Macarena, renamed the Maldacena in honor of a new discovery within the theory. The chorus seemed particularly telling. Who knows what it all means? I don't. I confess. Hey, Maldacena. There were 14 verses of this. Lucienne only stayed for two. The rest she read about in the New York Times. Crackpots, Lucien thought then, but now she's not so sure. It's the dream that's changed her. The dream of the black hole, V325B Andromeda. In this dream, Lucien is not at her observatory with her graduate student, not a doctor of astrophysicist at all. In fact, she is not even a woman. In this dream, she exists without form or space. She has no nationality, no family. In this dream, she is all and none. She is a part of some vast being and intelligence. When Lucienne wakes, she's always unsettled. The dream gives her a headache, a delicate throb at the edge of each temple, and now it's begun to creep into her waking hours. At first, it was a shadow hovering at the edge of her vision, something she could sense was there, then gone, then back again, impatient, waiting. Now, sometimes if she stands still, doesn't speak, barely breathes. The darkness slips over her again, overtakes her, and she feels calm and powerful 
and at peace. Then the moment passes. Then it comes again, stays a little longer. Sometimes she wants it to stay forever. Right now in Paris, in this elegant old hotel, Lucienne is deep in the dream again. She shimmers in perfect pitch. There are others there too, even though she can't see them. She feels their presence, the essence of them. Ethan is there. The darkness of his particular beauty. Fresh cheeks still, after all these years, but tragic. She can feel his sorrow. And Marie is there too. Marie, her neighbor, with her tired hands and gifts of rose-hip jam. Marie, who rises every Sunday at dawn to bake bread and cookies for grandchildren who never seem to find the time to come visit her. And Josh, the contractor. Josh, who knocked down Lucienne's kitchen wall six months ago, then changed his cell phone number and hasn't been back since. Josh is there with his affable smile and winning excuses, as is her mother. Formidable. Lucienne feels them all, the core of them, what makes them human, their spark, and she is part of that and she is happy. Lucienne is unaware that her mother, Helene, lies on the bed beside her, soaking wet and curved into herself like the shoot of a dried fern. Nearly within arm's reach, Helene, like her daughter, is an astrophysicist, a woman who attempts to chart the darkness, fails sometimes. Helene is dying. It's so unexpected. That's what everyone will say. Helene knows that. This is to be a time of great celebration. The Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris was planning to honor her daughter, Lucienne, with a citation for her discovery of the black hole. Helene was invited to present the award. The committee was overjoyed at her acceptance and now will feel somehow responsible. It will be wonderful, they had said. One generation honoring the next. We will honor the future while we're remembering the past. But the past is something Helene wants to forget. Some call her a victim. Other wonders allow, and others wonder aloud if she was not a traitor during the war, a collaborator with the Germans. But one thing can be agreed upon. Helene has had a remarkable career. As a young woman, she worked with Frédéric Joliot Curie, the Nobel laureate and son-in-law to Madame Curie. If you can imagine it, Frédéric told her when they first met, it can be. I can imagine a great deal, Helene replied, and could. Her student work, though merely speculative, had focused on a process by which one could harness energy through neutron bombardment, something Frederick had always been working on himself. I'm making my own son, she told him when they first met, and she was. Indeed, it was also the perfect atom bomb. Whether she knew it or not is still a matter of public debate. Her career, however, was overshadowed by the war. Shortly after the Germans invaded Paris, Helene disappeared. One day she was working with Frederic, attempting to explore the feasibility of nuclear power. The next day, she was gone. Many years passed before she finally reappeared, in America, at a small new observatory in New Mexico with an infant daughter, Lucienne. The observatory was looking for a receptionist. Helene told them she knew how to answer a phone. Two months later, when she was caught at 3 a.m. adjusting the telescope, baby in one arm, she told them she knew how to do a few other things, too. Then she mentioned her work with Frederic, so they let her stay. But no one scheduled research, the director told her, and shook his finger at Helene as if she were a child. For a moment, it looked as if she would slap him or say something, but she didn't. Thank you, was all she said. Thank you was all she could say. It was 1957. There was only a handful of jobs for women in science in America. She seemed to have limited credentials. She couldn't explain why she came to New Mexico or how she knew the area so well. That was all classified information. So she just said thank you and considered herself lucky, even though the job required her to wear proper attire. No skirts shorter than three inches below the knee. No smoking. White gloves at all, time, at all times. So Helene answered phones in the daytime. And when the telescope was free, she spent her nights balancing Lucienne on one hip while searching the bruised heavens until dawn. No one, no one knew exactly what Helene was looking for. Every week, the focus of her research seemed to change. One week, she'd look for an unusual pattern in a set of wavelengths near Saturn. The next, she was searching for traces of boron in the shadow of a particular star at a particular coordinate. The only thing that remained constant was that when observed, her method seemed impeccable and exacting, and she was determined to find what she was looking for. She was unrelenting and often went weeks without proper sleep. She made notes that she would share with no one. 
Still, there was something about her devotion that touched the director, the single-mindedness of it. And so, a year after she arrived, he found a new receptionist and gave Helene her own office and a small salary. Soon, the mystery that surrounded Helene inspired curiosity. Several former French colleagues attempted to trace her journey to America, but could not. As far as anyone could tell, Helene had disappeared one day. But while the exact nature of where she'd been for 15 years and what had happened to her remained a secret, it was clear that something had happened. Something violent. Scars bore witness. One, a starburst, is still visible on her left shin. The other, on her scalp, feels like a bump. Underneath the flesh, a bit of something remains embedded. These scars are the ones that can be seen with the naked eye. The rest run deeper. Before the doctors discovered the right combination of small white pills, Helene would slip back into that moment in Paris when her life began to unravel, and, without notice, the shelling would begin again, in a car or on a sidewalk or sometimes at the grocery store. A noise, a look, a gesture would take her back into the past, the shrill skies and the shards of what once was. The Germans would arrive and conquer over and over again. Lucienne, her daughter, was raised in the shadow of this war. There was no choice. Lucienne had no father of record, no relatives to call, no place to go except to strangers. So during those moments when time became fluid and Helene spoke to those who were not there, screamed at bombs that were not falling, Lucienne stood alone, mute, waiting for the moment to pass. Her hands would sweat. Her heart sped, beat with fury. She wanted to join her mother's secret world, wondered what it would look like on the other side. Don't go, she thought. But of course, Helene did go. And one day, she did not return. So I'm going to stop there because there's quite a few more pages here in the second chapter of this book. Um, this is on my top 10 list. It is an amazing book. I'm going to read to you the inside of the cover just so you have an idea of what the rest of the book is like. Lucienne Kundera is an astrophysicist who studies black holes. Her mother, Helene, is a scientist as well, with a secret past that seems to be darker, more baffling enigma than anything the heavens can offer. Decades ago, during World War II, Helene was shot and fled Paris. Many years later, she reappeared in New Mexico, Los Alamos to be exact, with baby Lucienne and a secret she would tell no one, or perhaps couldn't tell. Now all Lucienne knows of her father is that he's dead. Who he is and where her mother was all those years is the one mystery she fears she may never solve. Thank you so much for joining me on Storytime Saturday. You have a wonderful day.